coming up on Influencing Entrepreneurs. It was hell. It was interesting. I sold big, beautiful homes for a living. Well, I never dreamed I was going to live in the big house, you know, the federal, a prison. After years of teaching entrepreneurship and consulting with numerous companies, I realized that when business leaders shared stories of their success, hardships, and mistakes, it always had an impact in the classroom. So I thought, why not share these real-life business cases for education and inspiration? I'm Kazmer Ward, and this is Influencing Entrepreneurs. On today's episode, we speak with Holly Pazut. Holly started her career in real estate. As the industry started experiencing growing opportunities, Holly built a real estate team and was among one of the top agents in the country. After years of hard work, Holly's career path took an unexpected turn. In 2012, Holly was indicted, pled guilty, and was sentenced to 21 months in a federal prison for mortgage fraud. After serving her time, Holly Pazut took all she had learned and became an inspirational leader. She wrote A Strange Path to Freedom and spends her time speaking with companies, university students, and organizations across the country, sharing her story and how it transformed her life. So thank you for joining us today, Holly. Thank you for having me. So you started off your career in real estate, correct? I did. Was it in commercial or residential? Residential. And, and tell me a little bit about the background in real estate. My background in real estate. Well, you know, I was a single mom. I, well, let's see, was I single at that time? I've been single married a few times. So <laughs> I can't keep a track. But basically, uh, I went into real estate so I could just make my own hours and do my own thing. I have three kids. And uh, so from the very first year through my entire career, it just got better, 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 better. So it was my everything. I was a residential realtor. I was with uh, big firms, names that you would know. I worked from home a lot of times, or I had an office within the firm, something like that. But and I predominantly work with listing age, uh, list uh, sellers. So you're you were a single mother. You have a career that allows you the flexibility to be there for your kids, Absolutely. and also provide food on the table. Absolutely, yeah. And as that progresses, you get more and more involved in yeah. real estate. Yes. So how does that progress your career? I had no idea um, what real estate could really do. All right. So I went into real estate because I wanted to control my hours. I wanted to be, I didn't want to miss the baseball games or the cheerleading events or a school play. And I had been in the corporate world prior to that. And, you know, it's difficult to get the time off and you have to arrive at a certain time, so on and so forth. So I thought, you know, where could I go where I can make as much money as I could do and still be with my kids? And so I kind of just went through all these different careers, you know, these ideas. And so I thought, well, real estate, that would be great. You're either going to sink or you're going to swim in real estate. It's kind of like one or the other. So that's what I did. You know, I just, I went in just thinking I'll just one deal at a time. I'll just do the right thing, take care of my clients. But Cass, I had no idea how it would just snowball and how fast I would climb. I had no idea. So you're, you're running your own business after leaving the corporate world. Your business starts to grow exponentially. And so at that point, is that when you decide, you know what, I'm, I need more help, I need partners? The first year, I remember sitting at my desk, I was pulling on my hair, and I was about ready to cry. And my broker walked by, she goes, you okay? I said, do I look okay? No, I'm not okay. I said, I, ha I don't know what to do, I I'm lost. I can't do this all. I was trying to do everything, all the different parts of the transaction. She said, you need an assistant. I said, I haven't even been a realtor for a year. How am I gonna do this? She said, if you don't do it, you won't last the rest of the year. So I thought, wow, I'm gonna to have to ante up. It's gonna be another expense. But if I don't put that money out to pay someone, I'm not gonna make it. So that's what I did. So I hired an assistant my very first year. And then I came to realize in very short order that I needed a buyer agent. And that would be somebody that would entertain the buyers so I could just take care of the sellers. So now you've, you've got your first hire. Yes. You, you're, now you're responsible not only feeding your children, yeah. you have more mouth to feed. Yeah. 
And now you're looking for a buyer agent. Yeah. Somewhat feed your business, but also be a partner. Yes. So how do you go about looking for that? They're a partner in the way that we work together, but I'm kind of the, what we call the rainmaker. You know, I'm the one who makes the phone ring, okay? And then I would give the leads, the buyer leads to the buyer agent. And that person would go out and take care of the buyer. And then we would have our commission splits if that property should close. So I kept listing the homes. Then she got too busy. And then I needed another buyer agent. So you can see what's happening. They're freeing my time up. So I'm concentrating on the lister, you know, because then the signs are in the yard and phones ring, people call from the signs. And then I'm starting to hire buyer agents. So I am forming what's known in the real estate industry as a team. As the rainmaker, you're just, you're feeding leads left and right. You're building inventory. Correct. Through, through you that. Will, yes, you always want to have a high inventory. Correct. So you build this team and how big does this this well, business get? Yeah, for you know, some agents go get very, very big and some are um, small but mighty. Um, I think the most I ever had maybe were three buyer agents at one time and then myself and then an assistant. So are you doing this all through your realtor name or are you sponsored by a, a larger realtor? Well, you have the big company, the firm, right, and then my name. So my name being Holly, I came up with the name Team Hollywood. So my slogan was kind of, who would help you with all your real estate needs? Da -da -da -da, team Hollywood. So, so you're building up this firm and it's starting, I mean, it's, it's hitting big success. You, right, you know. it did well. And uh, this, what year is this? Well, I started in 99 up to, you know, 2013, around there. So, and then 2013, you've got this team, this huge success, and what happens? Oh, let me tell you, I wish I could say life was just a straight line forward. Uh, but for me, yeah, it was pretty bad. I had a, I guess you could say, I had a knock on the door and the receptionist said, Holly, you have someone to see you. It was really rare that somebody would come into my office to see me. Usually I go, you know, to their house. I would come to your home. I thought, this is so weird. Why is someone here to see me? I wasn't expecting anyone. And so, um, you know, it's hard to even say. So I go into the uh, reception and there are these two men. I'm thinking, oh, it's not such a bad thing. They were actually two nice looking men. I thought, oh, this could be my lucky day, right? Not necessarily. Uh, they said, are you Holly? I said, yes. They said, could we go into a small room and talk? I said, well, for what's, what, who are you? And he hands me his card. <clears throat> it's the FBI. Yeah. And so they're visiting, and at this point, you have no idea why they're there. It's, no, it's in the middle of the day. Life was good, business was good, and they said, we need to talk to you. And so right away, you know, I'm like, my kids, everything's fine. We go in this room, and they sit, we sit down, and I said, what is it? And they said, um, do you know, and they mentioned a certain person. And I said, yes, I do. And they said, they, they said well, um, we want to ask you a few questions. And I said, ask me anything you want, you know? And then I answered their questions, and then when they left, they said, uh, Holly, we advise you to get a criminal attorney. So at this point, they only want to know if you know somebody, and it was somebody that you knew. It was someone that I knew. Somebody that was working for you. Not for me, but somebody that I had done some business with. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and I just want to ask, were they a client? Or will yes. they uh, appear in some? No, it's a client. So it wasn't even a partner or? No, 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 no. Okay. So you do business with a, a client the FBI thinks is irreputable. And all, all of a sudden they're advising you to get a criminal attorney. Whatever they were thinking, I can't say. But right. they told me, they advised me to get a criminal attorney. So I eventually hired a criminal attorney. And then, you know, then this was, do you want me to go into it a little bit? Are you well, so, ready? Well, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I'm ready either. <laughs> they, they've got, they have to have told you 
why to get a criminal attorney? Yes, because they suspected that there was criminal activity. You know, the, the, the FBI didn't tell me what they thought of me at all. They right. just said, we advise you to get a criminal attorney. So I went to my broker and I told her, I said, the FBI just walked in here and they told me, and I don't know what's going on. And they asked about some transactions and I told them, but all this time, I'm not doing any fraud. I, I don't know what's going on. You're a real estate agent. Yeah. Yeah, so I land up going to an attorney and then he starts the process. And then he starts the process to find out what is the criminal what, activity. What's exactly going on. Last I checked, being a real estate agent was not illegal. Correct. So what is the charge that they are coming after you for? I was charged with conspiracy to commit mortgage fraud and money laundering. And the case was started, I guess, during the, you know, the, the big market in 07 and then the collapse. This was a very long running investigation. It lasted probably about uh, seven years. Seven years of investigation in this area. That's a long time. Yes. So there are times I was, I continued to practice real estate all throughout this investigation. There were some days I would call my, I hadn't heard anything. I didn't know what was going on for years. I thought maybe my file dropped off their desk and they forgot about me. So they say so visited you, tell you to get a criminal attorney? One time. And then you don't hear anything? No, there would go long, long, long periods. Nothing, 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 nothing. So I would get, I gathered up all my files that had anything to do with this particular person they asked me about. I put a timeline together. I was just doing everything my attorneys told me to do. So you're cooperating? Oh, definitely, okay. definitely. I guess it was in, 2012, no, 11, maybe 2011. The um, I wanted to know what what they thought. What what is the FBI? What is the prosecutor? What do they have on me? You know, I don't know what's really what's going on. So they did what's called a reverse proffer. So they um, uh, we met in a big room, very intimidating room, an FBI building in downtown Charlotte. And they kind of went over all these things that they thought that they, I guess, had on me, which were very much out of bounds in many respects. Uh, I'm going to make this long story short, but now I got an idea of what it is that they think I'm doing. And what is that? Well, they thought that I was cooperating with this fraudster, okay, um, which sadly, I wasn't cooperating with him knowing that he was committing mortgage fraud. I did not know that he was committing mortgage fraud. You know, anyone that knows me, had I known he was committing mortgage fraud, I, I wouldn't have had anything to do with it. My life would be much different today if I had known that he was doing that. Now, I did a few things along the way that I can see where it would look a little bit suspicious, and I can see where some of the decisions that I made were probably emotional, not, not intending to commit fraud. What were some of those things that, okay. what were some of those decisions that were maybe more emotional that came back in the end? Okay, so, so we call them like kind of the gray decision, okay? So in business, whether you're in realtor, accounting, CPA, it doesn't matter, okay? You're always gonna be faced with one of those funny decisions, one of those like little critical, slippery slopey decisions. So for me, in my case, the very first thing I should not have done it is um, I showed him a house, a big, big million dollar home. And he said to me that he knew somebody that might want to buy it. I'm thinking, great. Now keep in mind, I represent the sellers. But I asked him, I said, how is it that you know somebody who might want to buy it? And he said, remember when I worked at the Mercedes dealership, I drove a fancy car and I met him back then. And um, he was no longer working there, but he said, remember when we met, I told you, um, he, he said, when I worked at the Mercedes dealership, I kept in touch with a lot of you know, influential people. And from time to time, if I see an investment opportunity for them, I let them know. That's who he thought somebody would, 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 would buy, want to buy the home. 
well, there's no crime in that. I thought, well, that's kind of odd. He's a referral. Yeah. So then he said to me, he said, can you pay me a referral fee? In my line of work at the time, you're not permitted to pay a referral fee to anyone unless they are licensed. See, and he wasn't licensed. So I said to him, I said, well, I'll lose my license if I pay your referral fee because you're not licensed. So I knew, but then he said, well, Holly, he said, it's really not a referral fee. He said, because you're not gonna work with my friends. I'm gonna work with my friend. He goes, and I'm really just doing a lot of consulting. See, he said, so how about if I send you a consulting fee as long as this home, if it closes, you know, if this is the one. I thought about it. See, here's where you get into that, you know. Uh, it so sounds good. Yeah, it sounds, I, I'm thinking about it. I didn't like it. But then I thought, you know what? It's my money. I'm not hurting my client. And if, the, if it closes and he sends me it, I'll pay it out of my company account, just like a cost of doing business. And that's what I did. Had I not done that, he probably would have found somebody else. So what happened is, from what I understand, because I'm not an attorney, and I'm not the FBI, you know, but from what I understand, by me giving him that money, I helped him or them or whoever further their dirty little crimes. My, my question would be this, that happens. Does it happen again? It happened three times. Three times. So at this point, they probably, so, an yes. attorney probably thinks it's a, it's a pattern. It's a pattern. Yes. So yes. you end up in the office now with your attorney, with the FBI, and now they're actually talking about your your charges, which were conspiracy to commit fraud. Or? That would be that was considered mortgage fraud. That w so you were considered part of mortgage fraud right. charges. Right. 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 May I ask? is this fraudster, as we'll call him, is, right. is he being charged with anything at this point or is it just Holly, the real estate agent? Uh, this person, well, let me let me back up. There were over 91, I believe maybe 100 people that either pled guilty or were found guilty at trial. Two remain international fugitives today. The man that I knew that I thought was my friend is one of those international fugitives. His last known address was Iran, in Tehran. So we don't have any jurisdiction, so. There are people being, that are pleading guilty. There are people on the run. And now you have paid a consulting fee. And, and let's just, just so we don't get hung up on the, the terms, it, it's an infraction. It's against the law in the law's eye. So you now, are being advised by your attorney to plead guilty. I went through several attorneys. The case is very, very involved, and there were other things that went on throughout this investigation. But um, I started with one attorney. I landed up hiring another that paired with that one. And then I thought those guys were a little bit scared, and I wanted to fight. I, my choice was either to plead guilty or to go to trial. I didn't want to do either one. I, you know, and so then I hired a third attorney. And um, so then there were, you know, there were a lot of complexities to the case. I'm not going into all those complexities in all the different behaviors and decisions and so on and so forth. But eventually um, we got to a point where the FBI or the prosecutor said, okay, time is up. She's got to make a decision. What does she want to do? And so after listening to my attorney, it's kind of like this. Um, Cass, I'm going to pop you in the heart or I'm going to pop you in the kneecap. Where do you want it? So I took the kneecap and so I pled guilty. And then um, after I pled guilty, you know, actually I was able to practice real estate for a little bit. I don't, I don't think the commission the North Carolina Real Commission really felt that that was right or they were ready to abandon my livelihood. So I wasn't a menace to society, Cass, at all. Of course I wasn't. So I continued to practice real estate. But then, for all those years, every day I would get up to get business going, I had 15 months to transition. So every day I would get up and try to figure out how I take my business down.
So let's talk about what you refer to transition. So you've pled guilty. You know, you're not a menace to society. Well, is it a slap on the no. hand? Is it a fine? No, 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 no. So I plead guilty. Okay. So now I'm, I guess I'm a, am I, I don't even know. Am I, a, I guess I'm a felon at that point. Okay. So I la have to let the commission know, the North Carolina Real Estate Commission, which they already knew what was going on. I had already talked to them. So this, that was, wasn't like they were blindsided. They were well aware of my case. You've cooperated. I all went to along. them a long time ago yeah. and told them. But you've cooperated with the, the I've board, always, the I've FBI, yes. the courts. Yes, yes. So why, do I look scary like I'm not going to cooperate? I, am, I, am I safe here? I just, I, <laughs> oh my I haven't heard any, I haven't heard anything to the contrary. Listen, I'm non-violent. Okay. <laughs> so, so as it turns out, I, um, yeah, so I, I, I had plead guilty, right? And the day I pled guilty, I, well, put it this way. Before I pled guilty, my attorney notified the North Carolina Real Estate Commission and said, this is what I'm going to do. And part of it was that I would continue to practice real estate for 15 months. I was the head of household. I was the only income earner in my house, me, and I'm responsible for three kids. So because I'm not a menace to society, I'm not reckless, I'm not hurting my clients, they said that they would allow me to continue practicing real estate. So I had to, you know, you're used to getting up and advertising and go, go, go and creating bigger business and things like that. Now I'm thinking, I don't even want to get up, but my income is going to end in 15 months. And is, is that the main punishment is you need to shut your, your real well, estate well, company down? I, yeah, I'm not going to have a license in 15 months. So I have 15 months. I'm thinking, do I work really hard and try to make as much income as I can? Because I don't know when the hearing date will be. I don't know when I'll be sentenced. I don't know how so long anything will... So there's a chance that you'll be sentenced at this point. Yeah, see, once you plead guilty, then you have to wait for a sentencing hearing. And at the hearing, they tell you where you go and for how long. See, the, I mean, you, I wasn't aware of all these these steps, but it takes a very, very Did you long know time. You, there was a chance you might be sentenced to jail time? Um, the, I was told I would probably strongly avoid active time. But uh, I got active time. But what happens is they, they give you a, a report called a pre-sentencing report before you go to your sentencing. And when I was reading it, I didn't like the way it was written. I thought some of the things were a little bit out of bounds and I was starting to make some changes and I think that it upset everybody. And so unfortunately, I think maybe the prosecutor didn't think I was remorseful, which I'm terribly remorseful. But at the same time, I was trying to not have things written that were a little bit gray. I wanted it kind of correct. You know, that's what it's supposed to be. And um, anyways, it turns out, I think I got people upset. And so at the sentencing hearing, the prosecutor decided to go after me for more time. So my, my question is real quick, can you define active time? Yeah, active time means you're in the prison versus you could, um, you could be serving time, but from the confines of your home. Okay, so there was like a chance of house arrest. Correct. Okay. Correct. So uh, your sentence, and how long are you sentenced to active time for? So I was sentenced for 21 months, okay, to a prison in West Virginia. However, I served 13 months of active time. See, what people don't understand, and then, actually, I was eligible to come home after 10, but they messed my paperwork, and they said, well, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer, Miss Pazoot, till we find a place to send you. I thought, oh, I'm just sitting here in prison just waiting for them to find a place to send me home because when they send you home, Cass, you don't go home. You go to a halfway house. So then you go to a halfway house and live there for a little while, and then after the halfway house, you, you leave there. And is that still considered active time? Yes, yes. Then you have, then I had a year of probation. After the first year, they just said, oh, just release her, she's done. You get sentenced to a prison up in West Virginia. Right. You've built a very successful business before that. Correct. 
and now you're going into your first day in a prison time, which is something you never planned on. What is that first week? It was hell. It was hell. It was interesting. I sold big, beautiful homes for a living. Well, I never dreamed I was going to live in the big house, yeah. you know, the federal, a prison. Yeah, yeah it was horrible. It, it was horrible. So, so you, you serve your time. Right. You, I'm sure at some point you're rethinking every decision that led to that point. Right. You're also looking at how to get back out, get to see your children. You've had to make arrangements to make sure they're cared for. They're adults. They're yeah. adults. They are they're, have their own cars. They have their own jobs. They're on their own at that point. You're doing that and you serve, you said 13 months. Mm -hmm. Active time, you come out, you're on probation. You're starting from scratch again. Correct. Are you just going to go get a job? What do you, what do you decide to do? You have to have a job. You have to get a job when you're in the halfway house. So I was fortunate enough that a, a builder, a custom home builder hired me and I worked in the office, which I had some experience with in the industry. And that's what I would do. I would work for him Monday through Friday. And then I would, after I left the office, then I would return to the halfway house and I'd stay there, go to sleep, get up the next morning, scrub the toilets, do all the stuff you have to do. And then I would drive to work and so I did that for about four months, and then I think after that I, I could, I, I didn't have to work at that job. So I decided I did not want to stay there. So what did you decide would be your next career? Well, it, it really found more me, I think, because after what I went through, I found myself doing a lot of writing. Prison changed me. I thought I was going to be able to come home and go back to, you know, a life. But then I started thinking, you know, I, I'm not 20, and now I'm a felon, and who's, you know, I don't see a lot of opportunities. <laughs> We're looking for mature felons, you know, to, to hire. And so I thought, how am I going to redefine myself? I'm, I'm still young enough to work, and I wasn't ready just to be flicked off like that. But I was kind of getting tired of real estate. I always tell my realtor friends that. I go, oh, well, that was one way to get out of real estate business, but I'm not advising it. Was it, even, <laughs> was it even an option to go back into real estate? No, not in this state. That's right. a good question. No, not in the state of North Carolina. I could go to another state and go into it, but, you know, truthfully, I, I don't want to. There's not a lot of love loss anymore for me. It was, it was great at the time, and it did everything I hoped it would, the career would do or that I could do for my family and be a provider. But now I've done that, and I've been to prison. Now I'm home. Now what am I going to do? And so I, I did a lot of writing, and so over time that writing kind of turned into chapters. Eventually, I started blogging, and you know I was getting some comments like, "Oh, that's really interesting," and you know that's funny, and things like that. And then I eventually put it all together. So all of that came together, and you put it together, and it turned into a strange path to freedom. It did by Holly Pazu. It did. So you have a book. Everybody wants to write a book. Oh and gosh, I never, do, do, I never wanted to write a book. I thought I'm too tired. It sounds like too much work. <laughs> and this not only tells the the story of what happened to you, but lessons learned. It's really, yeah. It's not about the case. Like I said, the case has, you know, legal words. It was a long. It was it was uh, complicated. I still don't know all the ins and outs of the case. So it's not about the case. It's a little bit who I was prior, before I had any awareness of the FBI and so on and so forth. And then it's really about the life in the big house from my perspective, which is usually kind of a, maybe a spiritual lens and kind of a quirkiness, you know, from my little perspective, um, and how women are bonded whether you're free or you're incarcerated we still have a way of taking care of one another nurturing one another um, hugging each other when someone's crying or needs help i mean just because someone is in prison doesn't mean that they don't have a a sense of humor or um, sincerity and, and things like that 
and and he, there's 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 a lot of funny stories in that book. A lot of funny stories. And to be in that situation and find humor in small things is probably what helps get you through. It got me through. It totally got me through. So you started your first business, you go to prison, writing a book. Once the book's done, the real business starts is now you've got to sell the book. Right. So what does that business turn into? How do you sell your book? Well, really it's interesting because I didn't want to write a book. I, I wasn't one of these, these people that like, oh, someday I'm going to write a book. I th really, I thought, I don't need to write a book. I know my story, right? So what happened was I did a lot of speaking in prison. Well, not like a lot, not any more than anybody else as, a, um, as an inmate, but I did get to speak at times in prison, in the chapel, and I enjoyed it. And during that time, I would have many of the ladies say, oh, Pazoot, you, no one really doesn't go by a first name in prison. We're all, you know, so I was Pazoot, and you know, somebody might say, hey, Pazoot, I love it when you talk. You make me laugh, you make me cry, you make me think. And, I'm, and I had fun when I was doing it, you know? And um, they said, when you go out, when you go home, you need to keep speaking, you need to keep talking. And I thought, well, I never had a problem talking, you know, I always, <laughs> so anyway, so in order to, be a speaker, it's the first question is, do you have a book? And so I really wrote the book to further a speaking career, was so, really the reason. So now you, you work as a public figure, you go around, you do motivational speeches, and how do you, how, how has that business blossomed since then? Well, it's interesting because, you know, I'm just Holly, okay? And I just share a cautionary tale that can basically happen, I guess, just about to anybody, okay? And I share it predominantly with your white collar professionals, whether it's a realtor or a CPA or an escrow, whatever it is, all right? At the same time, I love to tell my story and more of a story of perseverance and courage to audiences that are seeking motivation and challenge and growth and, and self-worth and things like that. So I kind of have two different audiences. So I, I speak when I want and if I don't want to, I don't. What was the biggest lesson you learned in prison? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Hmm. Well, I'm going to just tell you the first thing that popped into my mind, okay? Oh gosh, this room is all men, here we go. <laughs> I have three kids, right? I have two boys and a girl. And one day, um, yeah, I, I probably will get emotional, but you know what, so what if I do, right? My kids came up to see me, which they were there all the time. You really know who loves you when, you, when you're in the pits, who shows up is who's on your team, right? Well, they were definitely on my team. So this one particular day, I was having a rough, a rough spot, you know, it's just kind of tired and, you know, it just sucks the life right out of you, prison does, or it did for me. So I was telling my kids, I said, um, I said, you know, I just feel like I live in a hole. I said, I feel like I'm just in one black hole. Nobody even knows what's going on. I said, I'm just worn out. I'm tired. I just can't do this anymore. I was having one of those moments. And um, my oldest son, his name is Rocky. He looked at me and he goes, he goes, mom, he goes, I understand you're having a hard time. He said, but mom, I know you feel like you live in a hole, but holes are not to be lived in. They're to be climbed out of. He said, we are doing everything we can do, everything to help you. He goes, but mom, you gotta put your hands up. You gotta help yourself too, you gotta climb. And I just looked at him after he said that to me, and I thought, wow, he must have had a great mom. <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said, I am so happy to have met you. I said, thank you so much for telling me that, and you're right. And that kind of was it for me. 
So you climb out of that hole, you write a book, you start a speaking tour. What's next? I'm playing a lot of tennis. <laughs> You know, entrepreneurs have lives, you know. I don't just sit there, you know, all day long at the keyboard. Um, I want to continue speaking, uh, sharing my story. I'm getting a lot of good feedback, whether it's a small audience, a big audience. When I get feedback, like somebody like you uh, came up to me at a conference in San Francisco. I just came back from speaking at the National Association of Realtors. A gentleman came up to me. He had tears in his eyes. He didn't need to say much. Now, this is a big strapping guy. He came up to me and he goes, I think you just saved my life. Thanks, Holly. So you and I don't know what he was wrestling with or what maybe slippery slope decision he was contemplating, but I have a feeling that whatever it is, he's not moving forward with it. You know what I mean? I, I don't know, but just when I hear a little comment like that, those are indicators to me just if the door opens, Holly, just go through and keep speaking. If those are, you know, if you're helping people in those ways. Well, Holly, uh, I appreciate you being here today. Your story from entrepreneur to inmate to entrepreneur to inspiration has been great, and we appreciate that you joined us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash Nexogy Education or visit influencingentrepreneurs.com to catch up on previous episodes with Casimir Ward.